And uh, please do keep uh, Revelation 15 and 16 open. That'll be a, a real help. Um, allow me to pray and uh, let me ask for, for God's help as we come to his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your great love for us. And we do pray, Lord, as we read your word, as we consider what you're saying, that you would help us to understand, to hear you speak. Lord, we don't ask on the basis of our righteousness. We don't ask because of who we are, but we ask on the basis of your mercy and grace that you've shown to us in Christ. We pray, Lord, please uh, be gracious to us this morning. Help us to hear you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the the topics that Christians find the most difficult to talk about, I think, is judgment. It's an aspect of God's character that, if we're honest, perhaps we find the most embarrassing to speak about to other people, maybe. It's the part we're tempted to skip over or avoid talking about. Talking about God's love or God's goodness or his creative power, his wisdom, those things don't seem as difficult, do they? But talking about him as the judge seems difficult. Maybe it's not just difficult to talk about. Perhaps for you, it's one of the aspects of the gospel that you find the most troubling. You might have questions. Maybe you've got questions this morning. You've had questions in the past. Precisely because of this idea that God is a judge. Uh, Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. And perhaps one of the reasons is this idea of judgment. It's hard to stomach. It's difficult to understand, difficult to reconcile with the idea that God loves people. Well, this morning, these chapters of Revelation are perhaps some of the most troubling that we've read so far. Because it's clear in these chapters that the, the focus is God's wrath. God's wrath is a way of talking about his anger, and his anger leads to judgment. It's mentioned at least four times, chapter 15, verse 1, 15, verse 7, 16, verse 1, and 16, 19. The vision in these chapters is um, of seven bowls that are poured out on the earth, and we're told explicitly what is in the bowls. Chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. We're being given a a vision of of God's wrath poured out on humanity. Now we're going to see this morning what these chapters tell us about God's judgment. They're here to teach us. They're here to warn us. It's a loving warning. It's not pleasant to read about God's judgment, but warnings are necessary, even though they might not be nice to hear. But you know, the striking thing in this chapter is how God's people respond to his judgment. I think that is perhaps the big thing we need to to learn in this chapter. We find God's judgment perhaps uncomfortable or troubling or embarrassing. But look with me at chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. We'll come back to these verses at the end. But look at the song of God's people who've seen his judgment. What are they singing? Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. Here's the question. Could you sing like that as you consider the idea of God's judgment? Why are they singing like that? That's what I want us to think about this morning. Now keep that in mind, before we answer that question, I want us to take a moment to think about how this vision, how these chapters fit in with the rest of Revelation. And by the way, there's a, on the handout there are a few headings um, that might be helpful to you as you follow along. This morning we're, we're reading about these seven bowls. We've already had a few cycles of seven, haven't we? We've had the seven seals and the seven trumpets, and they too were telling us something about God's judgment. They were telling us something about God's judgment in history, judgment that is happening now, leading up to the the final climactic day of judgment. As we read chapters 15 and 16, you might have spotted some overlap between what we're told about the seven bowls 
and what we're told about the seals and the trumpets. In fact, there is a, a lot of similarities, especially between what we read this morning, the bowls and the trumpets. A lot of similarities. For instance, the first four trumpets were said to affect the earth and the sea and the rivers and the sun. And we, we get the same thing here. And the first bowl, verse 2, affects the land. The, the second affects the sea. The third affects the rivers, verse 4. And the fourth affects the sun, verse 8. They're similar. You might also remember that the trumpet judgments were modeled on the plagues. You can go and read that in chapter 9. The plagues from the book of Exodus, when God sent plagues on Egypt. And we get the same thing happening again here. These these bold judgments actually are called plagues, aren't they? Specifically called plagues. So are these bold judgments in chapter 16, are they just recapitulating what we've seen already with the trumpets and the seals? Are we just being shown the same thing again from a different angle? And you might think we are because as uh, me and John, we've been preaching through this book, we've, we've said a few times we don't think you're meant to read Revelation sequentially, okay? as if one thing chronologically follows the next. These different visions, they often show us the same period of history. They don't follow on from each other. They're simultaneous. They're happening at the same time as each other. That's what was going on with the seals and the trumpets. They were, they were showing us God's judgment in history leading up to the final climactic day of judgment. Now, at the risk of sounding confusing, something different is happening here, okay, with the bowls in chapters 15 and 16. Because here, in, here with the bowls, we're not seeing God's judgment throughout history leading up to the final day. We are being given a picture of the final day. Each of these bowls is giving us a glimpse of what final judgment day will be like. Maybe you could think of it like this. The, the seals and the trumpets, they were like the warning shots. They were showing us God's judgment leading up to the final day. And we saw, didn't we, that the purpose of God's judgment through history has been to, to call people to repent, to turn back to him. But now we're not reading about the warning shots anymore. This is the final judgment day portrayed vividly for us. Now, why do I think that? Let, let me give you the reasons, okay? Th a few reasons. Number one, reason number one, look at verse 50, uh, sorry, chapter 15, verse one. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues last because with them God's wrath is completed. There's something, there's something final about this vision. Then look at chapter 16, verse 17, the end of the section. Chapter 16, verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. Judgment is complete. That's reason number one. Number two, reason number two. Did you notice these bowl judgments are a lot more comprehensive than we've seen in the past? So with the seals, a quarter of the people were affected. With the trumpets, it was said to be a third of the people that are affected. But now it's everybody. Everybody is affected. And the other big difference, reason number three, here's the third reason, God's people are not caught up in these judgments. When we looked at the seals and the trumpets, often they described judgment that, that had an effect on everybody, Christians and non-Christians. There were natural disasters, for instance, that affected people indiscriminately. And, and that's what we've seen through history, isn't it? Christians are caught up in famine and drought and war and poverty just as much as anybody else is. But here in chapter 16, this is judgment that is falling on those who are not God's people. So look at chapter 16, verse 2. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land and ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. And the beast uh, is the servant of the devil in the book of Revelation. You can read about the beast in chapter 13. 
Um, you can watch the video that will be available soon. Those who have the mark of the beast, they're in contrast to God's people. Judgment is not falling on God's people here. It's falling on those who are not God's people. All of that is to say, here's the summary if you've lost where we're going. Here's the summary. What we're seeing here is not the same, not quite the same as what we've seen in the past. We're not reading about the warning shots anymore. We're zooming into the final day and we're going to see what it will be like. What will final judgment day be like? What do we need to learn about it? Three things to learn this morning. Number one, God's judgment will be fair. It's fair. And we're going to spend longest on this point, okay? I think this is the hardest thing for us to get our heads around. How can it be fair? Especially because, you know, one of the things we see as we read chapter 16, it's very clear that judgment will be awful for those who have to face it. Just have a look at some of the things that we're told in chapter 16. I don't think these are meant to be taken literally. They're pictures that show us something true about the agony of judgment. So verse 2, we just read it before, ugly, festering sores. Verse 8 describes the sun scorching people with fire, seared by intense heat, verse 9. Verse 10 describes a darkness, a kind of darkness where people gnaw their tongues in agony. Verse 11 talks about people cursing God because of their pains and sores. Verse 21 describes hailstones that weigh 40 kilograms. 40 kilograms falling on people. Now this isn't a photograph of judgment. Okay? This is not a photograph of judgment. These are vivid pictures, impressionistic pictures of judgment, but they're here to give us a sense of the pain and the torment of judgment. They're saying something true, that judgment is awful. This is what God's wrath is like. God's judgment will be unbearable for those who have to face it. So is it fair? That, I think, is the thing that is stressed in this chapter. We've seen in chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, just and true are your ways, God's people say. Look at chapter 16, verse 4, and let me just read verses 4 to 7 for us. And we see the same thing again. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgments, O Holy One. You who are and who were. For they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. True and just, those same words again. Now, what does it mean in verse 7? What does it mean that the altar responds? What does that mean? Talking altar sounds strange, doesn't it? I think it's here to remind us of chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Could you keep your finger in Revelation 16? Turn back with me to Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Because in chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, we, we heard another voice from the altar. It's page 1237. Chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, it was the voice of the martyrs, God's persecuted people. Chapter 6, verse 9 says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. And the answer was in chapter six, you need to wait. You need to wait longer. But now come back with me to chapter 16. Look at verse seven. The voice from the altar now is not saying how long. The voice from the altar is saying, yes, Lord, justice 
has been done. It's fair. People are getting what they deserve. I wonder if you agree with that. See, I have a feeling that we think it does sound fair for some people. It does sound fair that the people who've persecuted and killed God's people, they should be judged. That does sound fair. But the problem is that, that we, we know that judgment is on everybody. Not just murderers or persecutors, but on everyone who isn't one of God's people. God's judgment falls on your neighbor next door the family members who don't know Jesus, the people you see at the school gates, your friends, your colleagues. And I think that that is when we perhaps start to question, isn't it, the fairness of God's judgment because we can all think of people who are not Christians who are decent and nice and kind and thoughtful. And maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian, and the idea of God judging you as one of his enemies, it just seems completely wrong. Because you wouldn't consider yourself an enemy of God. You're just neutral towards him. How can judgment be fair? Look with me at chapter 16, verse 9. We get a sense of why this judgment is fair. Chapter 16, verse 9 says, They were seared by the intense heat, And they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. They didn't repent and they didn't glorify him. I think that fairly succinctly sums up why judgment is coming on the world. The Bible says every single one of us has turned away from God. We need to repent because of the way we've treated him. You know, God, God is the maker of everyone and everything. He's the king. He's the ruler of the world because he made it. He's, it's his. And he knows what's best for his creatures. And he tells us how we ought to live in his, his world. That's his right as the owner, as the ruler. But human beings have ignored what he said. We, we live our lives however we want without giving him a second thought. And we haven't glorified him like he deserves. You know, anything good in this world comes from God, doesn't it? Human beings are dependent on him for everything. Just just like a, a tiny baby is dependent on its parents for everything. Well, so too, we are dependent on God for everything. And yet human beings, we, we live our lives as if we're independent from God. As if he doesn't exist as if what he says doesn't matter. People don't glorify him. I'm sure I've used this illustration before, but if I commit a crime against somebody here, that's clearly serious, isn't it? But imagine if I commit a crime against the king. Now, no disrespect to anybody here, but committing a crime against the king is going to get me in a lot more trouble. Somebody quite a few hundred years ago now Describe the way that we have treated God as cosmic treason. It's far more serious than a crime against the king. It's a crime against the king of the universe. There is no greater crime. Cosmic treason. And you see it on display. Just look with me at chapter 16, verse 12 to 16. Verses 12 to 16 describe the sixth bowl. It describes the battle of Armageddon. It's got nothing to do with an asteroid that is heading to earth that needs to be broken up. This is a battle of the world versus God. Look, let me read from verses 13. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. Now this dragon and the beast and the false prophet, we met them in chapter 12 and 13. And what they're doing is they're rallying people 
for battle against God. So here's my point. When God judges the world, he is not bringing judgment against a world that is neutral towards him. He's bringing a judgment on a world that is set against him. An anti-God world. You might be sat here this morning, you might consider yourself neutral towards God, but the Bible says that's not true of anybody. And that is why judgment is fair. Judgment is fair. Here's the second thing we need to see about God's judgment. It is final. God's judgment will be final. There are no second chances on judgment day. It will be too late then to turn back to God. And in fact, actually, chapter 16 shows us nobody will. You know, one of the reasons I think we might struggle with judgment day is because we, we perhaps think that one day, on that day, God is judging people who will be pleading with him for mercy. But that's not what chapter 16 says will happen. There's a phrase gets repeated a few times in this passage, verse 9, chapter 16, verse 9, chapter 16, verse 11, chapter 16, verse 21. Three times, they did not repent. They did not repent. When God brings judgment on the world on that final day, it, it won't change people's hearts and minds towards him. And I think we might be surprised by that idea. Because we might think, you know, as, as soon as people see that God is serious, surely they'll turn to him. That's what my kids do sometimes, you know, when, they, when I threaten judgment. Perhaps at first, you know, they, they're not really sure am I serious. But once it's clear that I mean it, well, then they back down. But that's not what will happen, according to chapter 16. God, God is not bringing judgment on a world that is pleading with him to show mercy. Look at verse 11. When faced with God's judgment, what do people do? They continue to curse God. Their hearts will be hardened towards him. They refuse to repent. In other words, they, they, they refuse to acknowledge the rightness of what is going to happen. They're hardened in their hatred and their anger towards God. Do you remember in the book of Exodus? And do you remember Pharaoh and when God sent the plagues on Egypt and the nation of Egypt and sent the plagues on Pharaoh? Do you remember how Pharaoh reacted? It didn't cause Pharaoh to turn to God, did it? We don't read in Exodus of Pharaoh pleading for mercy. It was the opposite. He became hardened against God and his hatred of God's people. And that's what it will be like on Judgment Day. The time for repentance, the time for turning back to God is now, not then. If you're not a Christian here this morning, there is still time to turn back to God. Today is the day to repent and turn to him. Because when final judgment comes, it will be too late. Look at chapter 15, verse 1 again. Listen again how the day is described. John saw a marvelous sign. Seven angels with seven last plagues because with them God's wrath is completed. On that day, judgment will be done. Completed. No more to come after that. When this judgment falls, the conflict will be over. The battle will be complete. God's enemies will be defeated. Satan will be crushed. Which is why, point number three, here's the third thing to see about that day. God's judgment is fair. God's judgment is final. God's judgment brings salvation. It brings salvation. We might find the idea of judgment embarrassing or troubling, but I want you to see from these chapters that judgment is necessary. And in fact, there can be no salvation without judgment. There is no salvation without judgment. Salvation comes through judgment. Salvation and judgment have to go together. Just think a bit big picture, Revelation, big picture. Okay, The last few chapters of Revelation, what have we been seeing? Well, John has painted a picture of the world that is, it's not just broken, is it? That's not the problem with the world. It's not just that the, the world is broken and messed up. It's worse than that. It's that the world is evil. 
Last week, we thought about the dragon and how the dragon tries to attack the Lord Jesus and how he attacked God's people today. You go back and read chapter 13, you'll see more of the devil's tactics, how he uses governments and empires to wage war against God's people. And we've seen this morning, it's not just the devil, is it, who's anti-God. We live in an anti-God world. Nobody is neutral towards God. Now, if that's true, if that's true, if the world is like that, if that's a correct representation of the world, wouldn't it be unbearable if there was no judgment? Wouldn't it be wrong? In the martyrs, God's persecuted people, they cry out for justice. How can there be salvation without judgment? How could God's people be safe without defeat of their enemies? Salvation comes through judgment. Again, think, think back with me to the book of Exodus. And the reason I keep mentioning Exodus is because this, this whole passage is full of Exodus imagery. Do you remember when God's people escaped from Egypt and they, they stood at the edge of the Red Sea? And they crossed the Red Sea and, and, and as they were on the edge of the Red Sea, they saw God bring the waters of the Red Sea over their enemies, over Pharaoh and his chariots and his armies. Pharaoh and his armies were defeated. And what did God's people do? They celebrated because then they were safe. They were saved. And that's exactly the picture in chapter 15, verse 2. Just look at chapter 15, verse 2. I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea. Those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name... They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. They sang the victory song because with judgment comes salvation. When God's enemies are defeated, God's people are safe. And so as we come to a close, here's the question. Which side do you want to be on? Stay awake. Jesus says, chapter 16, verse 15, make sure you stay awake and be ready for the day. Just look at chapter 16, verse 15. It's 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 an outlier in these chapters, isn't it? Chapter 16, verse 15 interrupts the flow of everything. Because we've been reading about these, these judgment bowls. Suddenly we get this verse about making sure you have the right clothes on. Chapter 16, verse 15. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. What clothes do you need to be wearing to meet Jesus? Verse 15 is telling us Jesus is coming. This is the day we've read about, final judgment day, it's coming. He's coming like a thief. No thief is going to send you a letter telling you when they're going to come. It's unexpected. Jesus could return any time. It could be tonight. There'll be no warning. So we need to be ready. So what clothes do you need to be wearing when Jesus returns? Well, you need the clothes that only Jesus can provide. You need the clothes that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now, the only reason we can be confident of not facing God's judgment is because Jesus faced it for us. He's given us the clothes that we need. He's washed them in his blood. So keep them on. Now is not the time to get changed. Now is not the time to switch sides. Because judgment is coming. It will be fair. It will be final and it will bring salvation for God's people. Let me end with chapter 15, verse 8. Just look down to chapter 15, verse 8. It's part of the introduction to these bowl judgments that the seven angels are given these seven bowls of wrath. And this is what we're told. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. No one could enter the temple until the wrath of God was completed. Well, on that final day, 
wrath will be completed. It's done, verse 17 says. Which means for us, for God's people, not only do we look forward to safety and salvation, we, we look forward to having access to God himself. The wrath we deserve has been taken by Jesus. And so one day we will dwell with him forever. So stay awake. Let me pray.